Good evening. We'll be join. We'll be starting in another few moments. Good evening, oh, Father. Good evening, good evening. I'm already ill. Yes, Father. We'll, we'll start in another five okay. minutes. Fine, fine. Okay, okay. Yes, Father. Yeah. Am I audible? Clear? Yes, Father. Yes.
begin? Um, father? Uh, shall we? Shall we begin, Father? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. A very good evening to one and all who have tuned into today's webinar. On behalf of the management, Director Reverend Father Gerald de Souza SJ, Principal Dr. Pratima Prabhakar, Vice Principal Ms. Pauline Priya, the staff and the students of St. Joseph's College of Law. I take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to today's webinar, which has been organized by the Campus Ministry of St. Joseph's College of Law. The theme of today's webinar is aptly titled, St. Ignatius, a relevant saint for the modern world. Uh, in, order, in our pursuit to introduce the great person of St. Ignatius to young minds, Jesuit institutions, have earned the reputation of catering to the poor and the needy. This stems from the deep inspiration that they, were, they have acquired from the life and the teachings of St. Ignatius, who has given the time-testing experience and teaching that we can experience and discover God only in the service of others. As we enter, 500th year of conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola, I'm sure the values of St. Ignatius becomes all the more relevant to all of us to contemplate on. Prayer. We must speak to God as a friend speak to his friend, servant speak to his master, now asking some favor. Now, acknowledging our faults and communicating to him all that concerns us, our thoughts, our fears, our projects, our desires, and all things seeking his counsel. May I now request Varsha to lead us in invocation hymn. Varsha, are you there? I request Balraj sir to kindly let Varsha unmute herself. Oh, Varsha, can you just raise your hand? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll start. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Dearest Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as I should. To give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and ask not for reward, save that of knowing that I do your most. Dearest Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as I should. To 
give and not to calm the cause, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and ask not for reward, save that of knowing that I do your most holy Thank you, Varsha. May I now request our director, Reverend Father Gerald de Souza SG, to address the gathering. Good evening, one and all. As we are aware, tomorrow we are celebrating the feast of our founder, St. Ignatius of Loyola. We are also in the Ignatian year celebrating 500 years of conversion of St. Ignatius. In this webinar, we want to understand how relevant St. Ignatius is to our present context. Some people in the history have thought, have written, and many have confined themselves to their immediate context. But a few of them have remained relevant to all times. And we know St. Ignatius is one such saint who went beyond his immediate context. And therefore, we can uh, proudly and boldly say that he is relevant to our context and he will remain uh, relevant for all the times. Today, then let us try to understand the relevance of St. Ignatius in the context of uh, pandemic apparently a hopeless situation and also in the fast changing technological world. We have an apt person in Father Joseph de Mello to enlighten us on this topic. I thank Father Joss C. Mello for accepting to talk to us this evening. I appreciate the initiative of Campus Ministry of St. Joseph's College of Law staff and student coordinators. May St. Ignatius continue to inspire us. Thank you. Thank you, Father. May I now request Ms. Pauline Priya to introduce the speaker for today. Thank you, Ms. Madhura. A very good evening to one and all present here. I deem it a privilege to welcome and introduce the speaker for today's session. Jossi, Father Josie de Mello, dare I say, is an authority on Ignatian spirituality. He is renowned for his lectures, not only in Bangalore, but throughout Karnataka. Father Josie joined the Karnataka province for the Society of Jesus in the year, 1990, in the year 1988. He was the assistant novice director in Mount St. Joseph's, Bengaluru from the year 2002 to 2005. Father obtained a master's and doctorate in spiritual theology from the University of Comilis, Madrid, Spain. He was also the program coordinator of Prerana and Ignatian Spirituality Center in Bangalore from the year 2012 to 2015. Father has also been the coordinator of the master's program at the Igna in Ignatian Spirituality at Jnanadipa Vidyapith, Pune, from the year 2016 to 2018. And he has also taught at the same institute from the year 2015 to 18. Father was also the secretary for the Commission on Ignatian, Char on Ignatian Charism in South Asia for six years. He is also the socius to the provincial of Karnataka since January 2019, and he presently resides at Loyola Mandir, Bangalore. Father, we are delighted and very happy to have you with us this evening, and we look forward to your address. We request you, Father, to address our students. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I now request uh, Anthony Cruz? 
from second DBA LLB to moderate the session while Father Josie takes over the session. Over to you, Father Josie. Reverend Father Gerald de Souza, am, am I audible? Okay. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Reverend Father Gerald de Souza, Principal Pratima Prabhakar, Vice Principal Ms. Pauline Priya, Ms. Madhu George, and my dear friends. I'm reminded of Father Praveen Hridayaraj, who told me last year. Jossi, I will call you next year for one talk uh, on Ignatian spirituality or on the person of Ignatius. And I'm sure he is present with us. And thank you for this invitation. Now I will uh, make my presentation. Uh, I will use the slides. Yes, Father. The slides are visible, Father. Yeah. Friends, this is my presentation, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, a relevant saint for the modern world. My presentation will have following parts. In the first part, I'd like to say something about Ignatian year. Father Gerald de Souza already made a reference to it. Second one is about our context today. When I speak about Ignatius of Loyola, relevant for our modern world, we need to see what is our context today. Third one is more on the relevance of Ignatius to our modern world. And last part will serve as conclusion. So let me begin with the Ignatian year. We are in the Ignatian year, dear friends, and this Ignatian year began on the 20th of May, 2021, and it will conclude next year on the 31st of July, 2022. And in that sense, we have one more year to go to conclude this Ignatian year. The theme of this Ignatian year is to see all things new in Christ. You see a logo there, Ignatius with the cross 500. That is the logo for this Ignatian year. What do we celebrate during this Ignatian year? We celebrate three things during this year. First of all, we celebrate the fifth centenary of the Battle of Pampolona that took place on the 20th of May, 1521. And we began the Ignatian year on the 20th of May, 2021. And that day we celebrated or observed the fifth centenary of the Battle of Pampolona. We call it as the cannonball moment. The second one is about the fifth centenary. Fifth centenary of the book of the spiritual exercises. Ignatius did the spiritual exercises for about 30 days in Mandresa, in a place called Mandresa, in the year 1522. Later on in 1523, he started writing this book of the spiritual exercises. And today, many Christians do these spiritual exercises. It's an instrument or tool for transformation. The third part of the celebration is the fourth centenary of the canonization of Ignatius of Loyola and Francis Xavier. In the church, some people are raised to the status of sainthood. When people are, are very holy and they do uh, important deeds, such people are raised to this status called the sainthood. And Francis Xavier and Ignatius of Loyola, they were raised to this status on the 12th of March, 1622. And on the 12th of March next year, we'll be celebrating the fourth centenary of this Ignatian year. Now I'm moving to the next part. Our context, context of COVID-19. I'm just rushing through this uh, 
this slide, when we think of COVID-19, there is fragility of human life. We also notice there is rise in unemployment and poverty. In the second COVID wave, we have experienced a global health crisis. There is vaccination divide. We have also witnessed crisis, crisis in education system. There is a digital divide. In the newspapers, we read a lot this, about this digital divide. If you go to North Karnataka, in some of our villages, hardly anybody is able to attend these online classes. At least 40% of our youth, our children, are not able to attend these online classes. And therefore, we ask, what is education? Is it only covering the syllabus or is it something more than covering the syllabus? How do we assess our students? What about mentoring? What about character formation of our students? Therefore, there is crisis in education system today. If you look at our youth, they are going through anxiety and depression and it has increased, it is on the rise. But on the other hand, we have also learned several things. We say COVID has no religion. COVID has no caste and class and creed. It attacks everybody. And therefore, we need to fight it as one family, as one group of humanity. And therefore, we have realized the importance and significance of interconnectedness. And now there is a new religion called humanity that is emerging. People feel ultimately what matters is humanity. We need to serve others. And in this context, we see the optimism of our youth. Our youth were not pessimistic, rather they were optimistic and they went and they went and reached out the marginalized. They helped the poor. They were busy in giving food materials. They were also burying the dead bodies. This is what our youth have done. And we notice a sense of optimism. Our society has a heart. That's what we have experienced during this COVID. Another context is of the death of Father Stan Swami. It has been a crisis moment for the Society of Jesus, for the Jesuits, for the people, uh, people of goodwill, and also for our society at large. We notice there is violation of human rights. So many human rights activists are languishing in our jails. The voice of dissent is suppressed and there is a sense of death of democracy. But on the other hand today, many more Stan Swamis are emerging. Stan Swami wrote a poem, a caged bird can sing. And despite this, uh, uh, this reality, a painful reality, people are singing the song of freedom and liberation. There is also greater awareness on violation of human rights. And friends, I would like to highlight these two realities of our, of our country today. One is COVID, other one is violation of human rights. And therefore, we are going through a crisis moment. We can address any crisis or we can approach any crisis in two ways. One way of approaching crisis is saying it is danger. It will ruin us. So there is fear and hopelessness. If you remember how some people approached COVID, some people, they were so scared of COVID, they did not want to meet people and they were living in fear and hopelessness. On the other hand, we have also seen people approaching COVID, considering it as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to serve others. We need to be bold. At the same time, we need to be prudent. And there was a sense of hope and optimism in some people. Looking at the whole scenario of human rights too, yes, we may live in fear, hopelessness, but we also notice there are some people raising their voice despite all threats, because it's a time for us to make a breakthrough. And therefore, there is hope and optimism. I have the imagery of a crisis, how we can approach crisis. You see this picture down below. It is a curve and you see the vehicle there, just going to that hairpin bend. Crisis is like a curve. 
but let us not forget it is not the end of the road rather it is the beginning of a new direction provided we approach any crisis properly and today as i look at our youth i feel deep within me many of our youth are also going through crisis and so we look at the life of ignatius ignatius teaches us how to face crisis in our lives and therefore he is a very relevant saint for our modern world and also for the youth now let me come to the life of ignatius you know ignatius was born in spain in 1491 and when we look at his year in 1521 we normally talk about that battle but i'd like to go back to the year 1517 i would like to say here there were three crises in the life of ignatius the first crisis was loss of jaw at the age of 16 that is 15 not 7 ignatius was sent to a place called arevalo to work as a scribe of juan velasquez de cuellar the chief treasurer of the kingdom of castile he was working under king ferdinand now let me explain this ignatius lost his mother when he was a small kid then he was taken care by his sister in law now when he reached the age of 16 his father sent him to this place called arevalo as a scribe of juan velasquez de cuellar and he was the chief treasurer and here we notice there is a kingdom called kingdom of kasti and the king king is the king ferdinand and under him there is a chief treasurer his name is quelia his surname is quelia and now ignatius is working as a scribe under this chief treasurer and this chief treasurer quelia he knew the family of ignatius very well he contacted ignatius father and ignatius father sends his son Uh, uh, his father sends ignatius to arevalo work as a scribe and ignatius here is exposed to a new world view he is exposed to a new reality altogether it is a career of public administration it is dealing with kings and queens there are political intricacies and eventually the profession of arms now ignatius is exposed to this world in 1507 onwards and what is the main purpose here craving for name and fame filled his aspirations during this period and now king ferdinand died 1516 and king charles the first came to the throne he became the successor of king ferdinand now this new king charles the first had differences with this quelia the chief treasurer about the wealth of the kingdom now therefore this king charles the first expelled quelliar from the kingdom and you know ignatius was working under quelliar and therefore ignatius too is expelled he is sent out unfortunately this quelliar dies soon after his expulsion expulsion from the from the kingdom and thus we can see a tragedy struck ignatius at the age of 26 in 1517 Ignatius was suddenly left orphaned without no resources now he was an unemployed youth he had no patron he had nothing it was the beginning of a crisis in the life of ignatius now we move on to the second crisis second crisis is the failure in the battlefield that is pampelona now we know this chief treasurer's wife maria de velasco she took pity on ignatius because he was jobless you see when somebody is in distress somebody is unemployed someone else comes and helps this is what the experience of ignatius failure is not the end but it is a beginning now this maria de velasco gave ignatius 500 coins and two horses and sent him to the duke of nahera who took idigo into his service basically he asked him to work as a knight in his army inigo as a knight was an officer to the viceroy's guard that is duke of nahera and it is in 1521 there is a battle in pampelona 
Pamplona is in Spain. Now there is a French army and the Spanish force. You see the, you see the number of the French army. There were 13,000. And the Spanish force was only about 1,000. And Ignatius was part of the Spanish force. For Ignatius, Spanish kingdom was everything. And what was his whole uh, aspiration? Let us die rather than surrender. Because main army officer said, let us surrender because there are 13,000. We are only 1,000. But Ignatius was adamant. He said, let us ready to die, but not surrender. Ignatius also said, we will fight to the death. And in that battle, a cannonball struck the leg of Ignatius. His right leg was shattered and left leg injured. There is another crisis. It is also called the cannonball moment in the life of Ignatius. Now there is a third crisis. Ignatius is brought from Pampolona to Loyola. Who brings him to this place? Normally, the enemy soldiers would kill their opponents, whereas the French soldiers, they look at Ignatius with great admiration. They admire the loyalty of Ignatius towards the Spanish kingdom. And therefore, they took Ignatius, they nursed him for a few days there in Pamplona. Then they bring him to his hometown. This is around 72 kilometers away from Pamplona. And they bring him and leave him at Loyola in his hometown. Now, Ignatius was so particular about his external appearance. You remember, his already right leg is shattered. Another one is injured. And now when they want to do the operation, Ignatius realized that his one leg will be shorter. <clears throat> that, is, that I've highlighted in uh, yellow color. His one leg will be shorter. But Ignatius was very upset about it because he felt this will be an ugly business. He will have a deformity. He could not accept it because he emphasized so much on his external appearances. And he could not bear such a thing because he was set on a worldly career and thought that this would deform him. And he asked the surgeons if it could be cut away. In other words, he told the surgeon, I am ready to undergo any amount of pain, but I would like to have a proper external appearance. I would not like to have any deformity. Why was this? Because Ignatius was in love with a lady called Catalina. Catalina was coming from a very royal family. She was of nobility. And basically for Ignatius, it was an infatuation. And in his autobiography, he says, sometimes I used to think about this lady Catalina for three to four hours daily. And he did not know how he was spending his time. Any other youth also would go through this, this experience. Therefore, I would, I would see Ignatius is very relevant for our youth. And now, you know, Ignatius realizes for lifelong, he, has, he had to limp. One leg will be shorter. And this brought an end to this relationship. He gave up his romantic dreams. Another disaster, another tragedy, another crisis. Let us put ourselves into the shoes of, of Ignatius of Loyola. Three crises, one after another, from 1517 till 1521. The dreams of Ignatius are shattered. It appears that he has reached a dead end in his life. So far, he thought he is the master of his life. Even this beginning to shatter. His self-glory begins to crumble. Could you recall any one crisis moment in your life? Maybe during COVID or before COVID. When I say crisis moment, it could be a death of a dear one, sickness, loss of job, financial crisis, crisis in relationship, crisis in studies, etc. I will give her just a 30 minutes, a 30 seconds pause.
I move on to the next point. The next point is called the sifting moment. We have the first moment called the crisis moment. The second one is the sifting moment. You see to my right, there is a picture of stones you see, and there's a strainer. What happens? The fine sand goes down and only the stones remain. And Ignatius is in Loyola. It is a moment of sifting. It is not shifting, rather it is sifting. What is this? At Loyola, you know, he is unable to walk, he is confined to his room. It is a lockdown period for Ignatius. And he wanted to kill time by reading books on romance and chivalry. Yes, he knows that his leg is shattered, but still he wants to read books on romance and chivalry. Unfortunately, in his family, his sister-in-law tells him that they do not have such books. And she gives him two books. One book is on the life of Jesus. The other book is on the lives of saints, holy persons. And as Ignatius reads these books, a holy desire surfaces. He reads the lives of these great persons, these great saints. And as he was reading, he tells himself, if these people can become saints, why can't I? I too want to become a saint. This lockdown, this moment of silence connects him to the inner world. It is a time of introspection for Ignatius. And he also begins to sift his inner world. He sees the thoughts on romance brought sadness to him. Earlier, the thoughts on romance brought great joy, great enthusiasm. But now it brought great sadness. On the other hand, thoughts on imitating these great persons, holy persons, brought great enthusiasm, joy. It was a sifting moment. And he notices a process from thoughts to choices. For example, he had thoughts about these great saints. All the time he was thinking about those saints. And as he was thinking, there were also certain feelings because we say thoughts elicit feelings. And what are those feelings? Feelings of joy, feelings of hope. I too want to become like them. And therefore there is a desire. Feelings turned soon into a pleasant desire. I want to be a saint. I want to be like these people. And that desire is leading him to make certain decisions. And he says, Ignatius tells himself, I want to go to Jerusalem because all these saints, they went to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place where Jesus went through his passion and died. And he says, I want to go to Jerusalem. And that was his desire. And that was his decision. And so he makes a decision to go to Jerusalem. But now here I would like to spend a couple of moments on this process from thoughts to choices. Let's say during the pandemic, what thoughts we had about God? Let's say we had pleasant thoughts. That means we felt God is close to us. God will not let us down. And when we had such thoughts, I'm sure we had feelings like pleasant feelings because these thoughts elicit feelings. What was those feelings? Feelings of hope, courage. And then there was a desire surfacing. We want to remain close to God. And how do we want to remain close to God? We were reciting our prayers. We were uh, listening to prayers online. And also we might have visited some churches, temples, mosques. These decisions we made. On the other hand, we could also have sometimes unpleasant thoughts about God. We could raise questions, where is God? Why God has left us? Is there God after all? And then we'll have certain feelings, unpleasant feelings, anger, despair, hatred towards religion. And the desire is, I do not want to think of God because it fills me with anger. And then the decision is cut off. I want to cut off my relationship from God. I do not want to go to any holy places. I do not want to recite my prayers. I don't want to think about God. Totally cutting off one's relationship from God. 
And today, many of us, not only youth, but all of us going through this turmoil within us. This is the inner world we are talking about. So it is better to become aware. What are the pleasant and unpleasant thoughts am I going through these days? About my family life, about my profession, about my students, about my relationships, about my neighbors. What are the pleasant and unpleasant thoughts that I'm going through? And in this pleasant and unpleasant thoughts, we also know we will have certain feelings. Pleasant and unpleasant. It could be also what is happening in our country, the whole context of the violation of human, human rights, constitutional rights, pleasant, unpleasant. What are the desires I'm having? A desire that leads me to be destructive or constructive? And what decisions do I want to make? Life promoting or life destroying? And what do I say this? Do I experience the pull? All of us experience this pull. A pull towards life promoting choice or a pull towards life destroying choice. If in my family, I always think negative about my family members, my parents, perhaps I may be having unpleasant feelings. And that will lead me to unpleasant desire. I don't want to talk to my parents. I don't want to go home. And finally, I may take such decision, not going home, deliberately avoiding my family members. Do I experience such pull, a pull towards good or pull towards evil? And therefore, friends, a battle goes on within each one of us, within the student, among the students, within uh, every student, and also among the staff, within each one of us. So what you feed in matters a lot. Therefore, check the process from thoughts to choices. From thoughts to choices. I have shown you just now. Some thoughts lead us to life-promoting choices, whereas some others to life-destroying choices. And therefore, one needs to sift one's inner world. Beware, the unpleasant world within can lead one to life-destroying choices. And so sifting is a mantra for mental health and well-being. Today, many of our youth are going through anxiety and depression. This sifting will help us identify which thoughts are not helping me and which thoughts are helping me. Continue to have such thoughts so that you are able to experience peace and also happiness. So to conclude this part, crisis moments are inevitable in our lives. They can propel us to new heights or flatten us to the ground. This is very important. Crisis moment we cannot avoid. They can propel us to new heights or flatten us to the ground. So the question here is, what were your predominant thoughts, including questions and doubts, feelings, desires during the pandemic? The pleasant and unpleasant thoughts, feelings and desires. The third one, seeing a higher purpose moment at Mandresa. On deeper introspection, Ignatius realized, that was that sifting moment, that he had survived for a purpose. You know, Ignatius had a terrific willpower. You notice he wanted to, he did not want to surrender. He had a great loyalty because for him, the Spanish kingdom was everything. Now we see similar willpower here, but tenacity to rise from the ruins. And he wanted to put together his broken dreams and shattered ambitions. And therefore he had that willpower. Now Ignatius begins his journey towards the unknown, a pilgrim in search of God, a search of meaning and purpose in his life. And Ignatius reaches a place called Mandresa. I told you at the beginning, here Ignatius did the spiritual exercises and also he wrote that book called The Spiritual Exercises. He stayed here for 11 months. Daily he spent seven hours in prayer. It is a voluntary lockdown. So far he gives so much importance to his external appearance 
Now he had grown his hair and did not cut his nails. He was clad in his tunic of rough cloth. He was wearing the sackcloth and he was, called, he was known as the sackcloth man. He started begging for his daily sustenance. He served the sick in the hospitals. He was a man on a search because he was in a different world altogether. He was not bothered what people are talking about him. And now his interior eyes were opened and insight into his life comes. You see, there is a picture, aha moment. It's a moment of intuition. A aha moment comes into his life. And he was captivated by a new meaning system. What is that new meaning system? So far, he looked at the reality as a fragmented reality. Now he sees divine, human, and cosmos. We are all interconnected. There is also a movement from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. This other-centeredness gives meaning to his life. Now he realizes, I am not the master of my life. Someone else is leading me. Someone else is guiding me. And this insight, friends, taught him the why of life. This is important. Purpose of life, living for others, to help my neighbors. That was the purpose. The purpose of my life is to live for others. Altruism we notice here. Now, he looked at his studies. He asked himself, why am I studying? Is it for my own glory, my own name? No, it is to, in, it is to help others. Why do I want to gather friends? He had a lot of friends. And he motivated those friends to serve others, for the service of others. So far in all that he did, Ignatius was the center. But now something else is the focus. There is a higher folk purpose in his life. As Viktor Frankl says, if you have a why in your life, you will live anyhow. He begins to lead a life of convictions. And now he finds the divine in his daily works. He finds the divine in his studies. He finds the divine in his work, whatever he does. He finds God in that. It is not only finding God in the temple, mosque, and the churches, but he finds God everywhere. And so he began to see things differently. I'll go ahead. The fourth one, the integration moment from Mandresa onwards. The last one. It is the moment of helping others. Helping others became the motto for Ignatius. Because this was the meaning system for Ignatius. He went in search of the poor and the underprivileged. He spoke the truth and stood for the cause of the poor. He told the Jesuits, wherever you go, don't leave the poor. Spend your time with the poor. You might be teaching in the universities. You might be in the churches. But visit the poor. Visit the sick and the suffering. He saw constantly the reality from the periphery. We are in the city of Bangalore. It is possible that we can see the whole Karnataka from the, from the city of Bangalore. But it is better sometimes for us to go to the rural areas and to look at the reality from that angle. So it matters from where do I look at the reality, from the center or from the periphery. Ignatius began to look at the reality from the periphery, though he studied in the University of Paris, a well-known university in Europe during his time. And therefore, when he wrote the spiritual exercises, he told us, you are reading the spiritual exercises. That is the text. But always bring your context to the text. So he invited us to have that interface, dialogue between the text and the context. Today, you are the students of law. Some of you are teaching law. And you have your own context. And we have context of India, context of Karnataka. And therefore, there should be a dialogue between the text and the context. It's an ongoing dialogue. And our context teaches us a lot about the law. In the text, in the classroom, we may look at the ideal. But when we look at the reality, we see the, the real. And we also notice there is a big gap between the text and the context. And therefore, we need to analyze our situation. We need to raise questions. Why is this gap? The context of the poor is also a text. And therefore, we need to constantly refer that text called the poor, and we need to be affected by it. 
and I can say the poor are our best teachers. They teach us a lot. So integration of the head, heart, and uh, head, heart, and hand. So that's what Ignatius teaches us in any education, in any way of life. We need to have the integration. Academic excellence speaks about the head. The character formation is of the heart, and the service of the poor is of the hand. So we need to have this triptych, the three dimensions in our education system. And this is what Ignatius had. And even today, it is relevant in the time of the pandemic and also in the time of the uh, violation of human rights. And it's also relevant for our youth today. To conclude, I have covered these four points. It was a crisis moment, a sifting moment, seeing the higher purpose and the moment of integration, the head, the heart, and the hand. To conclude, Ignatius was limping all through his life. You have seen that. And it was a reminder of the cannonball, of the crisis that he had in his life. But limping was also a pointer that Ignatius was not the master of his life. Someone else was guiding him. Someone else was leading him. And we see from this limping, from this crisis, in other words, from something called awful, something beautiful emerges. We have a great leader for the world and in the church. And it happened because of the change of heart. Ignatius was open. Ignatius was resilient. He was not pessimistic. And therefore, something beautiful emerged. And we can say the crisis moment was truly a life transforming event for Ignatius. And in that way, as we go through crisis, Ignatius is very relevant for us today because every crisis moment can bring a newness, a new life and a new hope to the humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear father. As every plant to be known as a plant as what it is today, it goes through different processes like seeding, planting, growing, and pruning. So too, St. Ignatius of Loyola has gone through different stages before he is known to the world as St. Ignatius of Loyola. You have indeed explained to us that a man known as Ignatius gone through crisis moment, sifting moment, seeing a higher purpose and the integration movement, which combines St. Ignatius of Loyola in the church today. You have enlightened every mind that we just listened to the talk and you have made us to know that there is a purpose for each and every one of us. Thank you so much, dear father, Joes. Dear students, now the form is open for Q&A sessions. If any one of you have any questions to be asked, please type in in the chat box. Dear Father, there is yes. the first question for you. Yeah. Uh, regarding the service of faith and the promotion of social justice, what are the challenges faced by the community in today's world? Yeah, this question is about faith and social justice. When we talk about faith today, sometimes faith is understood in a narrow sense. So sometimes faith is understood as uh, just going to the church, going to the temples, and going to the mosque, reciting our uh, you know, daily prayers. And uh, at times, there is hardly any connect to the reality, what is happening. 
sometimes let's say the the justice dimension or let's say there is discrimination so that is ignored sometimes we turn a blind eye to these things so today we when we talk about uh, faith faith is inclusive of justice because we read in the bible god listen to the cry of the poor so god listens to the cry and we as human beings we understand in christianity and other religions also we are children of god we are children of god and as children of god we need to listen to the cry of the other and as we listen to the cry of the other i think we need to extend a helping hand but at the same time sometimes we need to raise certain questions we need to analyze the situation it is not enough to just to give bread to the hungry but sometimes we need to ask why they are poor we need to raise certain questions so therefore today we see uh, when we talk about faith we cannot see in isolation faith is inclusive of justice now when you do this there are challenges because in any religion for some people it we also see sometimes conservatives for them faith means only doing certain things but we also see some people are very progressive who are also thinking from out of the box and sometimes such people are very few and therefore there is a tension within any religion in any community and as jesuits also sometimes we go through this tension it is not nothing special for us we also go through this tension we have some jesuits working in social action some jesuits also are teaching in the education field or also as formators some are working in the churches we go through this tension what is the challenge challenge is to speak the truth because when we speak the truth we have to pay the price we'll be also targeted we'll be challenged we'll be silenced so that fear sometimes many of us have that's what i said ignatius it was a crisis moment but i think he spoke the truth he was able to rise above and he was able to say no what matters most that means he emphasized the reality of the poor so this is what i would say thank you father uh, there is one more question yeah failure is not the end but the beginning was one among the motto of saint ignatius and he, how he went about in the life now today's youth do face a lot of challenges and it is nothing different from what saint ignatius faced centuries back but how can in today's context the youth can integrate the challenges that ignatius faced and the youth who are facing today in today's relevant context yeah when uh, we look at today's youth our society normally we look for when we go through crisis we go for quick results you now we are in a fast food culture we want to get quick results so therefore when i go through uh, this uh, difficulties struggles and especially when we go through a crisis i think we need to check what am i going through then where it is leading me and we know there are some people who have uh, also taken their lives they have committed suicide when they go through crisis when they go to depression so we need to check what am i going through that's what i said the sifting moment we need to process this and especially in such moments it is better that i consult somebody i talk to somebody person who is little enlightened not the person who is also like me going through a depression i i would consult somebody who would also tell me what i need to do so therefore when i consult somebody sometimes i also feel relaxed i also feel hopeful so therefore it is important and also who are my friends what do i read what do i think so a lot of processing i need to see so in this way i feel one way we have in our schools and colleges we have counselors and that is their role actually to guide our youth and then other thing is if i have lost my job if i have lost something okay what to do about it is there an alternative plan b for ignatius yes plan a was not possible now he looked for plan b he always felt there is plan b so similarly here if i say yes i want to do this now it is not possible is there plan b what can i do about it i will have the similar zeal i will not have no i will not to run away from that zeal or i will not reduce that zeal rather i will go with the similar zeal and i will approach uh, the 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 world so no it all matters also how do i think about plan b plan c this is how i would uh, respond to this question thank you so much father 
there is one more question. How to combat the battle when we have with the oneself, that is within, within oneself? Yeah, it goes on the similar lines what I said just now. Uh, first of all, I think we need to have greater awareness. See, what we say today is we are very good at external exploration. You see, there is digital exploration today. If you ask the youth, if you ask the children, if you ask them what is sex, children would know. Today, they need not go to the school about sex education. The children will tell the teachers what is sex and all that. So there is a lot of exploration. There are youth who are into pornography, addiction. So, but what is important to becoming aware and see what is happening to me? What am I going through? Yes, when I go through it, I have certain thoughts. They also have, I have certain feelings, but there are certain youth after some time, they feel something. I should not have done it. Uh, they feel bitter about it. We use sometimes they feel guilty about it, uh, which is not good. So they are going through something. And therefore, I think, first of all, awareness. Second one is uh, where it is leading me, where it is leading me. And the third one is if I got addiction, if I got something, because normally what I go through the inner battle is coming from a certain cause. Maybe I do not have a good relationship with somebody or it is because of the addiction. So therefore I need to constantly ask what is the cause from where it is coming? And therefore maybe I need to have a proper mindset. If it's a pornography, I need to ask. So this pornography is the symptom of something. That means maybe I have lacked love maybe in my family. So you know, how to supplement that love? Or if I do not have, enjoy good relationship with my parents and all the time there's a battle. When I go home, it is like uh, entering a, a, no, a world war, like at home, battleground. There's an internal battleground, but also external battleground. My parents are like my enemy camp. So that battleground, I need to become aware. And also sometimes it can lead me to a destructive choice. So therefore I would see, you know, I must do something about that external cause, which is not allowing me to live peacefully. So this is how I would respond to this question. Thank you, Father. The next question is, how discernment is different from wisdom? Yeah, first of all, we have to define what is wisdom and uh, what is discernment. Discernment is basically, you know, uh, always we look what is greater good in any discernment process. That means making choices. And we see in Ignatius, there was a higher purpose. So he went through a process of discernment and he always chose, you no, know, he wanted to choose good and that which brings greater good. When we say wisdom, is it, am I talking about wisdom that is already given? And I just say, no, this is, this is the wisdom that is there. So I'm not able to make a clear distinction, but uh, I can, I'll be able to say about discernment, but wisdom, I suppose, is already given. Uh, more of discernment is a process. It's a process. Wisdom is already given. And I say, maybe this is a wise thing to do right now. But discernment is a process. This is how I would distinguish. Thank you, Father. We have one last question. When there is a crisis, lot of negative thoughts influences an individual. It is challenge to define plans. So how to imbibe positive thoughts? It is very easy for me to give a lecture uh, but to tell about this, it is not very easy because it all depends my context. See, if my context is filled with tragedies, you no, know, from here I can say have positive thoughts. It is not very easy. But always I would say, when you go to tra tragedies and all that, and if it is going for a you no know, longer time, then I think make a pause, see what is going on within you, and then you analyze the whole entire process. When you analyze the entire process, you know what is the beginning of it. So then can I change? The beginning is mostly the negative thing and therefore I'm feeding in negative things. So therefore in the discernment we say, uh, or making decisions in uh, our way of life, like Jesuits we say, so first feed in the positive thoughts. If it is hatred, fill your mind with love. 
So what happens is sometimes, no, we want to experience happiness, but we do not want to go through this process. It is not very easy. At the one time I want, would like to reiterate, it is not very easy. So we need to you know, see what am I feeding in? Because if I feed in negative thoughts, there's a toxic environment within me. So I need to constantly feed in positive thoughts. Therefore, once again, I go back to awareness. We have something called mindfulness. All the religions talk about it. So I think we need moments of pause, moments of solitude. And also we need sometimes some people to guide us. So it is always better when you go and meet somebody, that person also can help you. There's one more question. Here's the same question, Anthony. Yes, Father, this one last question is asked by uh, Pooja. If a situation gives negative or depressing feelings, is it right to detach from it for temporarily and then getting back in it with more positivity? Yeah, that is a possibility. It is, a, no, but at the same time, don't suppress it. No, it is not to, not good to suppress. Like if I got anger with somebody, I will forget about it, but then I come with positivity, but I need to handle that in a nice way, channelize. Like if I'm angry with somebody, if there is an occasion, go and tell the person, no, I was a little bit angry, upset with you, so that somehow you settle that, resolve that. No, if you keep it, next time when the person says something, no, you will just blast that person. So it can be a bomb blast. So we need to be careful. First time you somehow controlled. So therefore, I would say yes, at the same time, no. It is good sometimes just to say, okay, I'm angry and I don't want to you know, react. Rather, let me be proactive. So you think positive about that person or positive about that uh, particular event. And then uh, you, know, you can come back to, to your work and all with the, with, the, uh, with the positive thoughts, with positive frame of mind. Thank you, Father. With this, we finish the Q&A session. And it is indeed, Father, you have enlightened every minds of all of us who are listening to this. At the same time, you also have imparted the Ignatian spirituality by being open to us and sharing with us the true spirit of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Thank you so much, Father. Over to Madhurama. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much for sharing the session so wonderfully. Thank you, Father, for that wonderful session and for enlightening uh, webinar address. And I also thank uh, Father Anthony for moderating the session. May I now request Jenny from Second BCom LLB to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Good afternoon to one and all. On behalf of St. Joseph's College of Law, I would like to thank our chief guest, Father Josie DeMello, for speaking to us about St. Ignatius, his early life, and the sufferings he had to go through, and how it is very relevant to us, especially the youth. His values of helping others and seeking a higher purpose in life has highly motivated us. Thank you, Father. I would also like to thank our director, Reverend Father Gerald D'Souza, our principal, Mrs. Pradima Prabhakar, Vice Principal, Ms. Pauline Priya, our faculty coordinators, Mrs. Madhura George, and the campus ministry of SJCL for giving us this opportunity to celebrate this week in honor of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Finally, I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you present here for coming and making this event a success. Thank you once again. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, may I now request a principal ma'am to share a few words? She has to be unmuted. Um, Ma'am? Balraj, are you there? Kindly unmute principal. Okay. 
Um, I don't think so, Father. Pal Rat Sir is here. Hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, sir, can you unmute, Principal, ma'am, please? Ma'am, she can un unmute herself. Ma'am, uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm so, I'm extremely, uh, good evening for this. I'm extremely happy to be part and parcel of this uh, webinar. It uh, uh, gave us a lot of insight. What is the purpose of a man, you know, a person's life and how it has to be dealt. How we should not waste our uh, life just like that. I mean, no, it is. It just it, it motivated a lot for the, especially for uh, the youth. It is uh, very good information and people who already Ignatius and Ignatius, we have been hearing so much about him. But when at, anybody will like, no, it it we understood that anyone can uh, realize the importance of life at any point of time. So only thing what is required is some point of time we have to realize, even though we are like diverted little in between. But at one point of time, that is what it is. It is uh, late than never. That's how it is. It gives us so much of that. So how can a person can, in the middle of his uh, age, can turn into a saint and become a role model to others? That is actually very eye-opener for many of us, including the teachers too. So I'm very thankful for this uh, excellent seminar and excellent uh, answers given by you to the questions posed by your students. Thank you so much for the Josie Melo and uh, our, for, for giving this excellent, excellent opportunity by our director to be part and parcel of the seminar. Thank you, Madhu, and uh, thank you, Pauline, ma'am, and uh, the campus ministry, all the members of this. Thank you once again for uh, organizing an excellent webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, before we conclude, I would like to conclude this webinar address by the quote of St. Ignatius, realize that illness and the other temporal setbacks often come to us from the hand of God our Lord and are sent to us to know ourselves better and to free ourselves of the loud things and also to reflect on the brevity of this life, thus prepare ourselves for the life which without end. With that quote, thank you all. And thank you students for being such a wonderful audience. And I wish a very happy feast of St. Ignatius to all of you. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.